Hi, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about walking through the variant interpretation process. So you've already learned filtration. You know, once you get this huge set of variants, how to narrow it down to a select few. You've learned about how to, you know, curate those genes to see if you should even pursue variant interpretation. So now we're at this third step. You know, you've found these variants, you've looked at the gene. Now you need to actually go classify these variants and determine if they could be causative for disease. So today I'm going to go first through some of the um, walk into the ACMG guidelines for variant interpretation, and then I'm going to spend about the last half an hour doing a demo um, of uh, a variant curation interface that you'll then be using during the workshop uh, process. All right, and I have no conflicts of interest. So going through the first part of the talk, I'm going to give a little bit of background with ACMG guidelines, um, and then sort of dive more deeply into the ACMG guidelines, looking specifically at legal frequency data, variant type and location, and patient data, and how to use sort of those three big buckets of data um, within variant interpretation. All right, so as anybody who's done variant interpretation in this room knows, um, this process is not black and white. Two equally qualified people could look at the exact same variant and come to two different conclusions about its pathogenicity. Um, that's because there is some subjectivity in this process um, of how much you would weight certain pieces of evidence. And this is evident by, um, if you look at how many variants in ClinVar have multiple submitters, how many of those are in agreement versus disagreement. Um, so this graph is a bit old now. It's from, I guess, February 2018. I should probably update this. But of all the variants in ClinVar that had at least two submitters, uh, about 17% of them have conflicting interpretations. Now you can see the majority of those conflicting interpretations are BUS versus benign or likely benign, but there is a set that are pathogenic versus BUS or lower. So these would be medically significant differences, um, showing that, again, there is this you know, somewhat of a subjectivity within variant interpretation um, as far as how to classify a variant. So to help with this process, in 2015, um, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, um, with the Association for Molecular Pathology, published this guideline for variant uh, classification. And so it, was, it provided an evidence-based framework to go through this process of being able to look at all the different types of evidence that a variant may have, and then use a combination of those evidence to, to classify the variant. Is, by a show of hands, is anyone in the audience, is this your first time ever seeing this grid? Okay, so it looks like most people know the grid. I don't need to go into too much detail with uh, explaining this process. Um, but you can see just briefly that all the different evidence types are separated out into either contributing to uh, suggesting pathogenicity versus a benign impact of the variant. And then even within each one of these sets, each piece of evidence is given a, a strength level. So for example, absent in population databases is a pathogenic moderate piece of evidence, um, having a well-established functional assay suggests no effect on the protein is a benign, strong piece of evidence. You then combine however many pieces of evidence you have and their strength levels to be able to reach a classification. Um, so these are the different combinations that was listed in the um, ACMG guideline paper about how to classify these. Oh, sorry. Oh, bad. So, it's been, so in a process where we were looking at um, discrepancies between laboratories and seeing if we could resolve those differences, um, we saw that a third of all discrepancies between clinical labs could actually be resolved just by moving to the ACMG guidelines, showing that this process does now help have a more common framework and more consistency in interpretation, so labs are more likely to agree on interpretations if we're both using the same framework versus not. So it's showing this is a step in the right direction. However, there are still this isn't going to resolve all differences. There still is some subjectivity into when you're looking at the ACMG guidelines of how to weight pieces of evidence. So for example, in this discrepancy process, we had each lab, when they were looking at a variant, report back to us exactly which ACMG criteria codes they used for every variant. And then we sort of compared for variants where we were still discrepant, what types of evidence are we most likely to be differently applied between the different labs? Um, so I have here listed just the percent that the um, evidence within this category contributed to discrepancies. So you can see the types of evidence that we were most likely to disagree on were population data and functional data. And if you look at how the criteria is phrased within both these sections, you realize there is some ambiguity into how they're phrased. For example, manual legal frequency is too high for disorder. Okay, who's to say what too high is for this disorder? You know, two different people could look at, calculate this threshold differently um, and then lead to differences in how we would apply this. Or even, um, you know, missense imaging with a low rate of benign missense variants and pathogenic missense variants are common. 
Again, there's not one definitive source to go point to for all the genes that would meet this criteria. So there are differently in how labs would look at this piece of evidence and decide if it fits for their uh, gene and variant or not. So in order to help with this process um, and provide some specifications to the ACMG guidelines, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the clin clinical genome resource or ClinGen. Marina introduced this uh, a bit yesterday. So this is a large NIH consortium um, that has the uh, mission of creating a, um, a, a genomic knowledge base to be used for uh, precision medicine. And sort of the main questions we ask within ClinGen is about the, um, the gene disease validity, whether there's actionable information. Um, but the part I'm going to be focusing on is the pathogenicity, the actual variant interpretation process. So within ClinGen, we have multiple variant curation expert panels that are taking the ACMG guidelines and adding specifications to them for their disease of interest. Um, so I have listed here the six groups that are, have already uh, made their specifications to the process, been approved, and now submit to ClinVar as expert panels. And so I'll be focusing a lot on the specifications that came from these groups during the, um, uh, most of the presentation. Um, but I also wanted to just share who are the groups that are coming up on becoming expert panels and specifying in the guidelines as well. So all of these different groups are in the process currently of piloting their specifications um, to the guidelines. And once they're approved, they will then start submitting to ClinVar as well and publish their specifications to the guidelines. Within ClinGen, in addition to having all of these different expert panels that are taking the ACMG guidelines and adding in their disease specifications, we also have this sequence variant interpretation working group. Um, which this group sort of has two main goals. One is to harmonize the approaches that these groups are taking so that there is some consistency in how each group is looking at a criterion and how they would specify it for their disease area. Um, additionally, um, we focus on making some general recommendations to the ACMG guidelines, um, specifically around criteria that are not really disease specific, um, but should be applicable to all disease areas. So for example, I've shown here again the ACMG guideline grid. And I've sort of color coded different criteria that either within SVI we are working on um, or if it's a type of evidence we think needs disease information. So for example, functional data, it's difficult to come up with a universal recommendation for how to apply this because it is highly dependent on the gene you're looking at and whether or not the assays have been validated for your gene. Whereas something like segregation data, we currently have a group working on how to um, specify this criteria because once we come up with a general framework for how to determine you know, how much evidence to give for a certain family with how much segregation you're seeing. Um, this shouldn't really vary by the disease area. I mean, it would vary by mode of inheritance, but um, beyond that, it really should be more consistent between different disease areas. So we're sort of splitting up the guidelines into, again, which criteria we think a disease-specific working group actually needs to look at and specify versus which are ones that are more general um, recommendations that we can put out for um, the community to use. So I've shown here just a screenshot from um, the SVI working group page on the ClinGen website, where we've been posting the different specificate or general recommendations to the ACMG guidelines as we've been developing them. So the first one I'm going to briefly talk about, just because it'll help with things I'm going to talk about downstream, is a recommendation we put out about how to rename a criteria code when you've modified the strength of that code. So the reason this is important is you know, they're within the ACMG guidelines, you know, each piece of evidence is given a code that talks about its, its weight. So a PP1 is a pathogenic supporting piece of evidence. But within the guidelines, they also noted that for certain diseases or genes, you may need to modify the weight of this evidence, especially within segregation. Within the guidelines, they even included this arrow showing it could be upgraded to moderate or strong. However, there was no recommendation about how would you name this code? If you move segregation from supporting up to strong, how do you signify that you did that? So the recommendation we've put forward is that when you are doing this, you would use the original criteria code followed by an underscore and then the new strength level. So if you were taking, again, this segregation PP1 and moving it up to strong, you would now call it PP1 underscore strong. And that's how you would signify within you know, either a report or when you're you know, listing what ACMG codes you listed, um, that you, someone would be able to tell that you modified the strength of this piece of evidence and you're no longer using it as a supporting piece of evidence, but now a strong strength level. All right, so with that, I'm now going to jump into now going more in detail into the actual ACMG guidelines, um, starting with looking at allele frequency data. So within the guidelines, there are three um, main criteria that deal with population data. Uh, BA1 and BS1, which deal with looking at the allele frequency and whether or not it's too high for your disorder, 
and then this PM2, pathogenic moderate, which is absent from controls. There is this fourth criteria, uh, prevalence and affected statistically increased over controls, but that one I'm going to talk about when I talk about patient level data, not with uh, the population data. So looking first at BA1, so this BA1, as it's written in the guidelines, was allele frequency is greater than 5% in exome sequencing project, 1,000 genomes, or, or exact. Um, and so this is sort of a exclusionary filter that you can use for variants to be like, okay, if this variant is above 5%, I can confidently call it benign. I don't need any other evidence. So within the SBI group, we had taken this criteria and made a few modifications to it to help with more accurate application of this criteria. So we had rephrased it to allele frequency is greater than 5% in any general continental population data set of at least 2,000 alleles for a gene without a gene or variant specific recommendation. So we added sort of two major caveats into how you would use BA1. So the first caveat is we added in this any general continental population data set of at least 2,000 alleles. And this we added in so that you are using a large and broad subgroup when you are classifying this variant so you aren't you know, accidentally calling a variant benign because it was in one out of 100 alleles in a very small inbred population where you know, there could be a founder variant. And so you want to make sure you're looking at a, a larger, more broad uh, subpopulation. Um, additionally, we said that the tested individual doesn't need to match the ethnic origin of the population that had the highest percent. So I've shown here a screenshot of a variant from Exact where you can see the overall total population frequency was only about 0.9%, but within Latinos was over 5% and there was more than 2,000 alleles tested. So in this case, you could call this variant benign. And you could call this variant benign for any person you see this variant in, not just Latinos, from any group. Um, and so it's important that you, know, you can look at each of the subgroups, um, the continental ones, and not um, having to only look at the total global minor allele frequency when um, applying, this variant, or applying this criteria. The second caveat we added to our, our proposed rewording of BA1 is that this would be for a gene without a gene or variant specific recommendation. And the reason we added this was for many disorders, 5% is orders of magnitude higher than is necessary. Um, the ACMG guidelines you know, went very broad and conservative because they wanted this to be applicable across you know, as many disease areas as possible. Um, but again, for, for most, 5% is, is higher than, is what, than what is needed. So what we did um, first to sort of kind of test this rule is we made an exception list for all the alleles in exact that were higher than 5% in any subpopulation, but there is some evidence that they could cause disease to sort of start with an exception list. Um, and so we have this posted on, the, um, on our uh, SBI website on ClinGen, this BA1 exception list, where we found nine variants with an exact. Uh, we haven't repeated this with Nomad yet, but of nine variants where, yes, they are higher than a 5% allele frequency, but there is some evidence that these actually could be causative for disease. Um, so, for example, the uh, common HFE um, variants where, you know, it is higher than 5%, but there is evidence that these variants can cause disease, but just at a lower penetrance. So you wouldn't want to accidentally just filter these out as benign because they have a higher than 5% minor allele frequency. And we have also a little nomination form on the SBI website if people think there are other alleles that are above 5% that should be added to this exception list. So now the second part of this, sort of the harder one, is how do you determine a gene-specific threshold? If we said that you know, BA1 is orders of magnitude higher than needed for many disorders, how do you figure out now what an appropriate threshold would be? So for this, we've been recommending that people use a calculator that came out of a paper from Nikki Whiffen in 2017 um, with uh, Eric Medical, I think, from Broad was involved in this as well. Um, and so I have the link here. You can also just go to cardiodb.org. It's probably easier to type in. And then there's uh, links up at the top for um, the allele frequency calculator. But essentially what this process does is it allows you to input your prevalence, heterogeneity estimates, and well as a penetrance to calculate a maximum credible population frequency for disease. Um, so I'll have a screenshot here. Yes next of what this interface actually looks like. So it allows you to, again, to input what your prevalence is, to do allelic and genetic heterogeneity, penetrance, and then we'll tell you what the maximum credible population allele frequency is, and then how, about how many alleles you would actually expect. And since it is a sliding scale, it allows you to really play with 
the different parameters you have and see how much of an impact it would have. You know, if you were doing a penetrance of 50% versus 60%, how much of an impact would it actually have on what your final um, you know, uh, allele frequency threshold would be? Um, so this is a very helpful uh, calculator to use when you're trying to figure out what a, a threshold should be for your disease uh, of interest. So I have another example of sort of how some groups have approached calculating BA1 and BS1 um, for their disease as of interest. Uh, so one approach that groups have taken for when they're looking at a condition with genetic heterogeneity is to, for the disease prevalence, pick the most common condition associated with that gene, because then you could apply it to any condition associated with that gene if you're starting with the one that is the most common. Um, and then for genetic contribution, to pick the contribution that comes from the gene that accounts for the most amount of disease, which I have an example of that in a moment, um, because then you could also be applying this threshold to any of the genes that are associated with this condition if you're already starting with which gene contributes the most. So for example, this is a, a graph of how the NYH7 ClinGen group led by, uh, from Birgit Funk came up with their threshold for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So they first looked at estimates of the prevalence was between one and 200 and one and 500. They decided to err on the most conservative side and just assume one and 200, which is probably unrealistic and is again very much erring on the side of conservative, but since this is to call a variant benign, they wanted to you know, err on that side. And for a contribution, they used MYH7, which can, accounts for about 11% of all uh, individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So if they, you had used this combination alone, um, the threshold would have been at about 0.03%, that anything above this would be able to meet a variant threshold and be able to call this variant benign. However, they know that there is reduced penetrance with this disorder. So they then sort of modeled, using different penetrance thresholds, what they think was a realistic threshold for how penetrant this disease is. So in the end, they end up going with a 30% estimate, which means you know, of all the individuals who have a variant within Exact or Nomad, they're only guessing maybe about 30% of those people would have disease. The rest are unaffected either because they're maybe a younger age, it just reduced penetrant, they haven't you know, been thoroughly evaluated yet. So again, they sort of erred on this very cautious side. So by adding in this uh, penetrance estimate, they actually ended up with a threshold of 0.1% instead of 0.03, because they're adding in this cushion of potentially unaffected people within population data sets. Um, so again, they sort of took an overall conservative approach um, again, also assuming that people within Exac and Nomad are more of general population than healthy controls, which for adult onset conditions is, is likely possible because most people within Exac and Nomad are older anyway, so they may not have presented with disease. So how this looks as far as how to get all these pieces of information and then use it within the calculator, um, I think it's helpful for, again, for prevalence to look at what the most common estimate is, the least common estimate, for heterogeneity to capture what gene contributes the most, um, also what variant contributes the most, and then estimates of, um, of penetrance. So again, for when they were looking at a threshold for benign, they used the most conservative numbers for all of these. So if they plugged in one in 200 for your prevalence, keep allelic heterogeneity at 100%, and then just add in the genetic heterogeneity here at 12%, an estimate of penetrance at 30 you can see they are getting this threshold of 0.1% um, as their uh, threshold for this disease. So what you could do for single gene disorders has varied a little bit um, by groups. I'll show an example of CDH1 in a second, but some approaches that groups have taken is for their BA1 threshold, which is the benign standalone, is picking the prevalence that is the, comes from the most common condition associated to the gene. This assumes the gene maybe has multiple conditions. Um, and then for BS1, which is, a little bit of a lower threshold that is often used for more of a likely benign threshold than uh, benign, is to look at whatever the prevalence of the next most common condition would be, or if there maybe is only one condition associated with this gene, use a, a lower estimate of the prevalence of that condition um, and use that within your um, calculation. So looking at CDH1, um, they looked at, you know, the most common disease associated with this gene is lobular breast cancer at about one in 800 people. Um, whereas gastric cancer is about one in um, 1,200 people. So when they were calculating a benign threshold, they would use the lobular breast cancer uh, threshold and plug that in and were able to calculate what they think the allele frequency threshold should be for this disease. So in this case, you can also see that they kept allelic and genetic heterogeneity at 100%, but 
which is a very conservative approach because what you're saying is we, you know, one variant in one gene accounts for 100% of lobular breast cancer, which we know isn't true, but it's sort of a safeguard to make sure that you're, you know, not going to incorrectly call something that's pathogenic benign by adding in all these different safeguards, you know, assuming that only one variant in this one gene would account for all of the disease. Um, so in this case, because they took a very conservative uh, approach, any variant that is above a 0.2%, you can then be confident is not causing disease because it is that variant would then be more common than the disease itself. So for what population databases to use, once you've just calculated your thresholds and now need to go apply these, um, I've listed here just some information about Exact and Nomad. So most people now are using Nomad instead of Exact. Um, but one thing I wanted to note was, you know, within Exact contains a large in chunk of individuals from ESP as well as a thousand genomes, and then Nomad includes almost everybody from Exact. I think there's a few that didn't make it over. Um, but I include this up here to show that you don't want to add people across different data sets because often they are the same individuals in ESP and Exact and Nomad. So it's best to just use one and not assume, oh, there was one count in each one of these. That's five people when really it's just one person and that person is now in all these different data sets. All right, so as far as now, once you've decided what population database you're gonna use, you now need to go look at what the threshold, or sorry, what the allele frequency of that variant is to determine if it uh, could be benign or not. So I've shown here a screenshot of a variant within Nomad. And if you've maybe noticed looking in Nomad, in addition to the you know, allele count, allele number, allele frequency, there is, some, there is this pop max filtering allele frequency. Um, and so in this case, when I took the screenshot, I was hovering over it so I can tell you it's from the African population. And so what this filtering allele frequency is, is it essentially is a, the population that has the highest allele frequency and then some confidence added in. So the bottom rung of the confidence interval. So you can see in this case, you know, it's a 0.14% from Africans is the filtering allele frequency. And that came from the fact that their, um, the African population had the highest allele frequency, which was 0.19. So you can see it's a little bit lower, the filtering allele frequency, because it's, it's looking at the 95% confidence interval and erring on the, uh, the bottom bound of that, um, just to you know, ensure that you are uh, an estimate of what the true population frequency of this variant could be. So this filtering allele frequency functions as equivalent to the lower bound estimate of the true allele frequency, meaning the filtering allele frequency will always be a little bit lower than whatever the actual allele frequency is, again, because of the confidence. And so because it already is adding in this confidence, you can then compare your filtering allele frequency to whatever your calculated maximum credible population allele frequency that we got from that calculator and be able to make this comparison. So if your threshold was you know, 0.1%, in this case, this variant is since it is above 0.1, you would then be able to confidently say this variant would, be, would meet your threshold and could now be called benign. Another interesting thing to note about the filtering allele frequency, so here's now a different variant where you can see the filtering allele frequency here is coming from the European non-Finnish. But if you're looking here, you can tell that actually this is not the highest subpopulation of all of these listed here. And that's because they only calculate a filtering allele frequency for the continental population. So it's not going to calculate it for other Ashkenazi Jewish or the Finnish population. Additionally, if there was only a singleton and that was the highest one, um, uh, Nomad will also not calculate a filtering allele frequency based off a singleton occurrence. And this is again is to sort of help that, you know, what if this was a variant that just had a very low coverage so it was only, you know, only 100 people were actually sequenced for this one spot and you found it in one person, you don't want to accidentally call that variant benign just because it met your threshold, but this adds in again sort of that confidence of making sure you're looking at a larger population um, cohort and not incorrectly calling something benign that's um, at a, um, a high allele frequency in a very small population. All right, to move on to now the pathogenic side, the absence from population databases. So this is PM2, a pathogenic moderate piece of evidence. And the way that it's worded in the guidelines is absent from controls or at extremely low frequency if recessive from the different population databases. However, one question that has come up as we've been, as different disease specific working groups have started to look at this criteria is for dominant disorders, does it really need to be absent or does more of a within pathogenic range make sense? And the reason for this is, um, so I included a 
quote from the um, Exec and Nomad papers about the individuals that are in these population cohorts. Um, you can see that they're saying they've made efforts to exclude, exclude individuals with severe pediatric diseases, um, but you know they can't completely rule out the possibility that some people may suffer from your disease of interest. So they have tried to exclude you know, young people who have severe disease, meaning old people with disease could be within these data sets because they aren't excluded. If they had adult onset conditions, you know, they may not have presented when they were um, being recruited for these studies. And this is evident by the fact that more than 70% of the individuals in EXAC are between the ages of 40 and 80. Only 10% are below the age of 40. So it is a relatively large, or sorry, older cohort of individuals. Um, so you do want to sort of keep this in mind if you are looking at a adult onset disorder that it's best to sort of view exec nomad individuals as general population instead of controls. And this sort of then plays into account for how much you think a, you know, what too common of a frequency within this uh, data set would be in order to say absent or not. So I've shown here now sort of examples of how, of what the thresholds have been for different um, disease working groups as, they, as they've looked at what their threshold for PM2 should be. And you can see it does vary considerably based on age of onset and severity. So for rasopathy, Noonan spectrum disorders, it's a dominant disorder that would be presenting very early on in life. And so this group expected that, you know, they don't think a variant should actually be present with an exact or nomad at all, because they would assume that any individual who had this disease would have been excluded because pediatric onset. Um, whereas something like cardiomyopathy, which is more of an adult onset, they've decided you know, a variant as high as 0.004% is okay to be able to say absent, meaning I think this allows for about four to six individuals with a nomad to have this variant before they would be suspicious um, that it's too high for the disease. And then you can see for the recessive disorders, the threshold is even higher because again, you're not expecting a carrier phenotype, so you are okay sort of allowing for a higher frequency of those variants um, to apply this criteria. All right, I'm next gonna move on to talking about criteria that deals with variant type and location. So within the guidelines, there was only one criteria that was given a very strong piece, uh, or very strong pathogenic evidence level, and that was PBS1, which is for null variants, nonsense frame shift, canonical plus one, two splice variants, initiation codons, exon deletions, um, in a gene where loss of function is a known mechanism for disease. So there are two important components to consider when you are looking at this criteria is one, for this gene, do loss of function variants actually cause disease? But then for two, does this variant I'm looking at actually cause loss of function? And so you need to make sure both of these are met in order to apply this criteria. So to help with this, last year, um, SVI, we published a paper um, of recommendations for using this PBS1 criteria, um, which I'll show we had this flow chart we came up with. Um, as well as considerations for determining if loss of function is a mechanism. So here's our proposal for how to determine if loss of function is a mechanism. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because I'm going to show some other ways you can look at this. Um, but essentially what we were suggesting is in order to apply this criteria, you want to make sure the clinical validity classification of the gene is strong or definitive. So going back to Marina's talk from yesterday, in order to apply this, you want to make sure that the gene is even associated with disease to begin with and then making sure that loss of function variants can cause disease. We had suggested that at least three or more loss of function variants should be pathogenic without applying PBS1, meaning there's enough evidence, other evidence that loss of function is causing disease um, within this gene before you would feel comfortable being able to um, say that loss of function is a mechanism. So other ways you'll go about this process um, of determining if loss of function is a mechanism or not. Um, one is looking to see if this variant has been, or the gene has been curated by the ClinGen dosage sensitivity map. Um, and so they go through and look at if a gene is, could be haploinsufficient sufficient or triplosensitive, and then give each gene a score ranging from zero to three, with zero being no evidence that you know, this gene is sensitive to, uh, to dosage, and three being the highest score, saying there is sufficient evidence that haploinsufficiency sufficiency causes the disease. So a way that you can find this is if you just go to clinicalgenome.org and type in a gene. So here I typed in MYBPC3. You can then get to the results page for this gene and see that one, it is a definitively associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then looking at the dosage, 
it, there, it, it was cured at the highest level, sufficient evidence for haploinsufficiency, meaning loss of function would be a mechanism for this gene. So however, the dosage sensitivity is not available for every gene because those, they go through a manual curation process. So there's times, you know, you might be looking at a gene and it hasn't gone through that. What are other ways you could determine if loss of function is a mechanism? Um, so one is looking at the loss of function uh, prediction scores with a nomad. So Anne went through these yesterday, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, she talked about the PLI score um, with a suggested threshold of a anything with 0.9 is suggested to be intolerant of loss of function. However, um, within NOMAD, they've been moving over instead of using PLI to this observed expected or OE ratio and sort of moving away from PLI. Um, so the range on here is also zero to one, but it's the opposite scaling as PLI. Um, with PLI, the closer to one means more intolerant. For the um, observed expected, closer to zero is more indicative of strong loss of function um, intolerance. And they suggested a threshold of below about 0.35 of the upper bound of this confidence interval suggests a significant depletion of loss of function variance. Um, so both these are still viewable within NOMAD, but I have noticed that they recently added a note that they are trying to move more to the observed expected um, ratio as opposed to PLI. Um, and one thing I should note, both these are really only applicable for dominant disorders. Um, for recessive, there isn't a great measure right now with a nomad of whether or not the gene is intolerant of recessive loss of function variants. Um, and also, as Anne was mentioning yesterday, um, in these cases, selection or constraint is really confined to phenotypes that are impacting reproductive age, um, because then you would see some restriction within those variants. So for example, BRCA1 and 2, which are very well established that loss of function causes disease in those, both of them have, I mean, have PLI scores of zero saying loss of function isn't a mechanism because those are later onset post-reproductive age, so you're not, you wouldn't see constraint for those genes. So I just include these just to note that both these are just predictors. They are not the end-all be-all of deciding if loss of function is a mechanism. Another helpful thing that um, NOMAD adds in is a, um, also tags to specific loss of function variants if they think they are low confidence. Um, so what I've shown here is uh, the gene PAX3 with the NOMAD. Um, and you can see, so uh, I have the track showing where all of the ClinVar path and likely path variants are here. Um, and then I've also restricted the variants to only show loss of function within NOMAD. And then you can see sort of the location of all the loss of function variants within this gene. And the size of each dot is indicative of to how frequent that variant is within NOMAD. So if you noticed, there are some very common loss of function variants right here at this little edge. And within NOMAD, they are labeled as LCLOF, so low confidence loss of function. And that's because if you kind of follow these variants up, they really only occur in this little part of one exon that is in one transcript and not present in the other transcripts. And if you look at the expression levels of this transcript, it's very low, whereas the transcripts that don't include this little part are expressed at a much higher level. So this low confidence flag is to sort of indicate that, yes, this is a loss of function type of variant, but it maybe is not actually causing loss of function. And so this low confidence tag appears due to either conservation, the variant being at the three prime end of the gene, or its uh, absence from the uh, canonical transcript. All right, so after looking at whether or not the gene could be causing loss of function, you then want to look at now, okay, could the variant actually be causing a loss of function impact? So to help with this, we've produced this very busy flowchart to help you go through the different variant types and the different considerations you need to take into account to determine if this variant really could be causing loss of function. Um, so I'm going to actually sort of skip walking through this because I have some example variants that I'll use to walk through these instead. Um, but essentially, we're looking at nonsense frame shifts, splice site variants, and then uh, multi-exon deletions, duplications, and initiation codons, and sort of the different considerations to look at. So the first example I'm going to look at is a frame shift variant within NYBPC3. So this is a 3297 duplication leading to a frame shift. So we would follow our nonsense frame shift flow chart. And so the first question we have to ask is, is this variant predicted to undergo nonsense mediated decay or not? And I should note, going back again to our, when I showed the screenshot of MYBPC3, it is definitively associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it's known to be haploinsufficient, so we're also OK following through with loss of function because we know that this is a disease mechanism. 
So looking at this variant, I've included screenshots here from Alamet, and I've highlighted where this duplication occurs, and it is within exon 30 of 35 um, within this gene. So you'd think, okay, great, we're early enough in the gene that you know, nonsense mediated de decay would be predicted to occur. However, one thing you need to keep in mind is when you are looking if nonsense mediated decay would occur, is you have to look at where the new stop is occurring, not just where the deletion or duplication is occurring. So in this case, because it's a frame shift, the stop doesn't occur till uh, 49 amino acids downstream. So in this case, here is where our duplication happened, but the stop isn't here until the next exon, um, which would now would be exon 31. So in this case, we are still before the last second to last exon, so we're still okay, the nonsense mediated decay would be predicted to occur, but just wanted to include this as a highlight to, again, remember to take into account where the actual stop is, not just where the genomic position of the actual variant is. So nonsense mediated decay is predicted to occur. The next thing is we would now need to look at whether or not this exon is present in biologically relevant transcripts or not. So if we look within NOMAD at MYBPC3, and if I scroll down a little bit further into the page, um, I've searched for this variant, so it's, it's the single one that's highlighted here. And if we follow it up, we can see it is within um, the exon that is in multiple of the transcripts. Looks like it's absent from one, but the one that it's absent from is not expressed at all. And the highest expressed one um, does have this exon where a variant's occurring. So we can feel confident this exon is in the biologically relevant transcript in this case, so we can follow through to this, which now means we can apply PBS1 at its full strength level. So next example I have is now a nonsense variant within P10. Um, so shown here where the nonsense variant is occurring. It is in the second to last exon, so it's in exon eight of nine. And any variant that is occurring uh, after the last, or within the last 50 nucleotides of the penultimate exon or the last exon is thought to escape nonsense mediated decay. So in this case, because this variant is within the last 50 nucleotides, it is thought to escape nonsense mediated decay, so it wouldn't be degraded, but maybe result in a truncated protein. So following through our flowchart again, we would now move to not predicted to undergo nonsense mediated decay. So the next question is, is this region a critical region? So if it's, even though you're not going through nonsense mediated decay, if you're truncated and missing a critical region, that could still be disease causing. Um, or, you know, maybe we don't know what the region is and then we would look into some um, other factors. So in this case, actually, the P10 expert panel had determined that the, the last codon of P10 actually does encode for a critical domain that is necessary for the function of this protein. So if you are missing any of the last exon, it is more of a, a literal loss of function um, because you can't perform, perform the necessary task as opposed to nonsense mediated decay um, process. Um, so in this case, because it actually is occurring before the boundary they decided at position 375, that, nonsense, that loss of function is relevant for this. But let's say in this case, okay, you didn't look at the P10 paper, you didn't know that they had said, oh, anything within the last exon is okay, and you can say loss of function is occurring. How would you know um, that you could sort of pursue this or that there is any suspicion that the last exon actually is relevant. So this is another case where NOMAD can be helpful to look at this information. Um, so showing again here is the track that has all the Clinvar path likely path variants, and then the NOMAD track showing where the variants in NOMAD are, and the genes being read in this direction. Uh, so if we look at actually at the last you know, chunk of the penultimate exon and all the last exon, you can see there are multiple path and likely path variants in Clinvar, and actually no variant, no loss of function variants within NOMAD in these regions, which is a little then suspicious that, okay, maybe there is some disease association within this last exon and that pursuing this, um, that maybe there is something to look into to see if this last exon is, is critical or not. Um, so you still may want to look in a little bit further. I wouldn't just trust just because there's pathogenic things in ClinVar, but this is suspicious that um, the last exon uh, uh, is necessary for proper function. And the reason I'm mostly including this is there's a chance in the variant filtration workshop that one of the variants you're going to look at, this could be an important thing to go consider. So just keep that in mind. All right, so for this P10 one, we would then follow through. This truncated region is critical for the protein function, and now we could apply PBS1 at, at a strong strength level. All right, the last one I'm going to do, oh, I'm going slower than I thought. I'm going to do a very quick one just of a splice site variant, just to give a different example. Uh, so in this case, looking at a splice site variant in PKP2. Um, here is the exon, and our variant is here at the minus one. 
So when we're looking at splice site variants, the first thing you want to look at is whether or not the exon is in frame or not. Um, because that'll help you determine if it's not in frame, then it could lead to a frame shift and a premature stop codon, and then nonsense being a decay. However, if the exon is in frame, then it could just lead to an in frame deletion, and you would then need to see, you know, what's, is there anything critical within that region? So in this case, you can tell because the exon is divisible by three, and you can also tell because the first amino acid only has two nucleotides, the last one has one, that this is a exon that is divisible by three, so it is skipping of this exon would preserve the reading frame. So we would follow this path of preserving the reading frame because it's divisible by three. Our next step, we now need to see, okay, is this region critical for protein function or not? Let's say we have no idea. So I don't know if it's critical for function or not. The next question is to look at whether or not loss of function variants in this exon are more frequent than you would expect, or is this exon even not present in the biologically relevant transcript? This is now another case where NOMAD can be helpful to determine this. Um, so I'm looking here at the P, PKP2 gene, looking at the two transcripts, and then all the oh, variants here. So this variant is present within our, our splice site variant is present within this gene. And we can look actually, it's definitely more common than we would expect. Um, and if you look at where it's located, you can see it's right on the edge of this one exon that is present in one of the transcripts, but not the other. And you can see the expression, the expression of the transcript that has this exon is minimal and the other one is quite high. And actually, even if you change to look specifically at heart expression, again, you can see that the transcript that doesn't have this exon is significantly expressed in the heart and the other is not. So this would suggest that even though this gene is intolerant of loss of function and this variant looks like it's loss of function, it actually is not caught, would not be loss of function because this exon isn't in the transcript, so it would be completely skipped over and wouldn't have an impact on expression. So in this case, then, you would follow through and actually not apply loss of function criteria at all because it looks like this variant itself would not be causing a loss of function impact. All right, we're on to missense variants. Um, the, there are two criteria here I'm gonna talk about. The um, missense in a gene that has a low rate of benign missense variants um, and the hotspot or uh, well-established functional domain and kind of ways to see if these criteria are applicable for your gene or not. So I'm gonna show an example here with MYH7. So as a way that we have initially suggested people can determine if this PP2, the gene intolerant of missense um, criteria could be applicable or not, is if the missense Z score is higher than 3.09. And this threshold was suggested in the exact paper. I don't remember the exact p-value they put on this, but it was shown to be a significant indicator that this gene is constrained for missense variation. So in this case, because our Z score is above three, you could be confident that, okay, missense is, is not so tolerant for this gene. Maybe applying this PP2 rule would be applicable. However, one thing you need to consider is an entire gene could be constrained or look like it's constrained because one region of the gene is very constrained. And so it's something you need to sort of take into account to determine if actually just one part is constrained versus the entire gene. So looking with an M87 now with the regional constraint scores, so Ann mentioned this briefly yesterday, but right now the regional constraint is only available in exact not nomad. So if you're within nomad, you just have to click to the little data set and move it from nomad to exact. Um, an interesting thing you can also see with an exact, the constraint score was six, whereas with a nomad was above three. So it also was even more constrained in exact than nomad. Um, but if you look down further on the page, there is this regional missense constraint metric. And so it sort of is looking at the, going along the MYH7 gene, looking at the observed expected within different regions. And it's showing that the, the five prime end here, because the gene's read in this direction, um, is more constrained than the rest of the gene. And if you kind of use your imagination, <laughs> you can see there are a lot more bubbles here showing variants in Nomad on this side versus this side. And there are significantly more path and likely path variants on this side versus this side, suggesting one part of this gene is actually more constrained than the rest. Oh, here's just the screenshot of explaining the constraint score. So it is where um, values closer to zero indicate increased tolerance or increased intolerance against missense variation. So again, for the, this PP2, your gene missense constraint we have suggested if the Z score is above three, it's a, a starting place to determine whether or not this is applicable or not. 
for the regional constraint, um, right now, you know, exec is working on those metrics, and I believe Nomad is going to be incorporating it soon. Um, we haven't determined what the best thresholds for these are, um, but I include this more as a note again to remember if it looks like your gene is overall missense constrained, it's worth looking in to see if some regions are constrained more than others, and so it's more applicable to be applying the PM1 versus PP2 um, to sort of determine if you know, there are more critical regions in the gene as opposed to the whole gene being constrained. The last thing under missense is computational tools. Um, so this PP3, which is talking about you know, if multiple computational tools suggest a deleterious impact um, that you could apply this criteria. I've shown a screenshot here of all the predictors for a given variant within the variant curation interface. Um, and then also a screenshot of what all these different codes mean. So for SIFT, it's giving you a D, which is damaging, or polyfend a D, which is probably damaging. And you can kind of go down and sort of see if there's a trend. So this criteria has been confusing for some because people sort of expect it to only be applicable if globally all the tools are saying damaging or not damaging. But the problem is, with the more tools you look at, the chances of them all agreeing decreases. Um, so essentially, what we've been more telling people in practice is that you can apply this criteria if there is a overall majority, or they are all more suggestive of a you know benign or pathogenic impact. So in this case, there is one tool that is suggesting tolerated, but the rest are all saying damaging. So in this case, I would still feel comfortable applying the PP3, even though one is saying damaging, because the other 10 are all suggesting there's an impact. However, it's also important to look at conservation. Um, so I've shown a screenshot here of this proline within UCSC track showing all the mammals. Um, I usually configure this track so that the dots mean it's identical to human. It helps you sort of jump out when something is different um, than the one you're looking at. So we can also tell that this position was completely conserved, which makes me feel also more comfortable applying PP3. Um, whereas, you know, if I was looking at this um, leucine, I would not feel comfortable applying PP3. So you kind of need to take both into account what all the tools are saying, but then also looking at conservation. OK, and time, I'm going to actually skip silent because we don't have any in the pilot or in the demo anyway, um, and move on to patient data. So within the ACMG guidelines, you can see there are multiple criteria that are about patients and how to use their information within the uh, variant assessment process. So we have this PS4, the prevalence and affected, statistically increased over controls, two different de novo criteria, this recessive one, and then also the patient's phenotype being highly specific. So how do you sort of use all of these together? One thing I should note, within the ACMG guidelines, I took a screenshot from it here, they do say that as you are looking at the evidence and classifying the variant, you should be including all cases studied, not just the case in front of you, meaning any of these criteria about the patient could be met from anything in the literature. It doesn't have to be the case in front of you. For example, you know, if you found a de novo occurrence in the literature, you could apply the de novo criterion even if it didn't occur de novo in the patient you're looking at because this variant has occurred de novo before. So it doesn't have to be limited to just the case in front of you. You would use all the evidence that is available about this variant when you're classifying it or applying any of these criteria. So looking at the de novo data, um, there are two different criteria within the guidelines. Um, either a moderate or a strong piece of evidence for a de novo occurrence, and they vary by whether or not um, maternity and paternity were confirmed um, or assumed. Uh, so we often say, call this one the de novo confirmed, this one de novo assumed. Um, but I want to clarify, when we talk about confirmed and assumed, it is about whether or not we confirmed or assumed that the parents are the parents, not that we're assuming the parents don't have the variant. In both cases, you have sequenced both parents and you have have checked that neither one of them is carrying the variant. When we say confirmed versus assumed, we're about talking about whether or not you are confirming those parent, those samples you tested are truly the parents of the individual versus not. Um, another important point that the ACMG guidelines included for de novo criteria is that you also would only apply this if the phenotype in the patient matches the genes disease association with reason, reasonable specificity. So just because you saw a de novo current doesn't mean, oh, yep, I can automatically apply its criteria, you also want to look at the phenotype and see, does this actually match with what I would expect for a variant within this gene? So to help with this within SVI, we have created a, um, a, a quantitative approach to um, the de novo criteria for how you can add multiple de novo occurrences together to reach a classification. So here's sort of the framework here, where the points for each case would vary by whether or not it is uh, confirmed de novo or assumed. 
um, and then also by um, how specific the phenotype is. So in the end, you would take all the different points you get from each one of the probands, sum them together to determine what the appropriate strength level would be. So this is helpful if you, you know, have found multiple de novo occurrences of one variant, you want to give it more weight than you know, just the strong piece of evidence you would get from one de novo, you want to be able to elevate this piece of evidence. So I'm going to join, jump to just an example here. So example that was in the, uh, the paper was NIB, NIPBL and Cornelia DeLange syndrome. So a very specific phenotype from this gene. So let's say you had three patients that had um, uh, a de novo occurrence of this variant. One of them had the de novo occurrence was confirmed, and then you had two assumed. So in this case, for how you would determine the points overall, for this confirmed one, because this is a specific phenotype, I would give it two points. And then for each one of these assumed ones, I would do one point because, again, it's a phenotype highly specific for the gene, but it's assumed de novo as opposed to confirmed. So you would end up with four points total, two from the first case, and then one point each from the second and third case which will give you four points, and then you could actually apply it now the de novo criteria at a very strong strength level instead of the strong or moderate strength level. Uh, so moving on to the recessive disorders, PM3. Um, so this criteria in the guidelines, you know, is written as for recessive disorders detected in trans with a pathogenic variant. We have rephrased this one slightly. Um, to say for recessive disorders detected in trans with a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant, and added the important caveat, in an affected patient. So just because you found two variants in trans, if the person doesn't have the disease, you wouldn't want to apply this criteria. So you really should only be applying this PM3 when the person actually has the phenotype you would be expecting. I'm going to jump again to the point. So we've taken a similar approach we did to de novo. We've tried now to make a point-based system to um, be able to determine the applicable strength of PM3. Because um, it is, there is often scenarios where maybe you need to downgrade the weight if the variants maybe, they found a second variant, but they didn't confirm phasing. Or the variant on the other allele, it's not path or likely path, but it's a very suspicious VUS, and you want to be able to give it some kind of point value. That's maybe when you would move it down to supporting. Versus if you're having multiple occurrences of this variant occurring in trans with a path or likely path variant, um, that then you would want to be able to be elevating the weight up to a strong or very strong strength level. So showing just an example here, if you had a variant that was found in a patient with PKU, and they also had a pathogenic loss of function variant in PAH, um, and you found this from a paper, and the authors never note cis or trans. They just say, here were the two variants in this person. In this case, um, I would assume then phase unknown, because they didn't actually say if they confirmed cis or trans, and because the other variant on the other allele is pathogenic loss of function, I would award a 0.5 points total for this case. And if this was the only case I had, I would then end up at PM3 supporting. So I would be downgrading from moderate to supporting for this one case. And the same works sort of going the other way. If you know, we had multiple occurrences, so here I have, you know, if there was two homozygous occurrences, three probands with confirmed pathogenic variants in trans, you can sum up the points you would get from each one of these occurrences um, and determine what the applicable strength level would be. Let's see. I think it's I the clock on here, right? Is it almost 10 o'clock? No, okay. I'm a little slower than I thought. <laughs> so I'm going to skip this PS4. Just to, a brief note that the way this criteria is worded in the guidelines is prevalence in affected statistically uh, enriched over controls. And in the asymmetric guidelines, they did include this note, though, that in instances of very rare variants where case control studies could not reach statistical significance, you could also use this criteria for times when you have a, you found multiple programs who all have this variant and it's absent from population databases. So, you know, it's not an official case control study, but the fact that you've now seen this in multiple people who have disease and not in controls is suggestive that it's enriched in, um, in patients. So we've been allowing different expert panel groups to be able to modify the weight of PS4 based on the number of unrelated probands that they've observed with this variant. Um, and then sort of the threshold for each strength level that they've um, sort of used for supporting moderate strong really depends on the specificity of the phenotype. Um, so grasopathy, P10, CDH1, where you're looking at a pretty specific phenotype, the threshold you need for supporting moderate or strong is lower 
then we saw the groups hearing loss or cardiomyopathy take, where you have to have more cases to reach that strength level because it's not as specific as a phenotype. Um, and so you, you know, want to be more confident that you know, it really is being enriched in these cases and it's not due to uh, other occurrences or phenocopies or other molecular causes for those um, uh, occurrences. And the last patient type I wanted to note was this PP4. Patient's phenotype is highly specific for gene. Um, and this is another one that is very variably applied because there's not a clear answer for what highly specific means. Um, but one thing we have suggested that um, is applicable for this criteria is that you could also use this for non-genetic confirmation testing. So for example, if you had a case with PAH and they had plasma phenylalanine levels that were high, this is suggestive, okay, this is a very specific phenotype. They have this readout from their amylites that is saying you know, they have this disease. Um, some had thought initially that this maybe would fit under functional, but we realized that these type of, you know, for assays like this, if it's not variant specific, but is instead confirming the phenotype of your case, it is more applicable to go under PP4 versus functional assay. Um, same with the mitochondrial group. You know, when they, if they've seen that there is reduction in electron transport chain activity in patient cells, that wouldn't be a functional assay because it's not variant specific. You are confirming, yes, this case has, you know, this reduced electron transport chain, and so this is confirming their phenotype, but it's not saying that it's due to those variants because it could be something else in that patient's body that is contributing to that phenotype. So for these types of assays, when you're looking really within patient cells, it is more applicable to use under PP4 versus functional data. So sort of just in summary, looking at all the patient type of data, um, you know, we have suggested that you would use PS4 when you are sort of trying to count probands from an autosomal dominant disorder. PM3 you would use when you're trying to count probands for a recessive disorder. We then have our de novo criteria, the PM6 and PS2, which you could apply if you have you know, at least one de novo occurrence. And then this PP4, which is you know, any proband that meets a really specific criteria for that disease. All right. So at this point, I was going to move over to the variant creation demo. But I thought I'd stop at this point and see, is there any questions about what I've gone through before I close this down and open up the, uh, the demo to show how to actually go through a variant curation in the interface. Any questions about guidelines? I know it was a lot of information and I went fast for some parts of it. No, it all makes sense. Everyone's going to get 100% on the variant curation workshop. Okay. All right, before I move over, I just wanted to thank the sequence variant interpretation work group, especially Les Spiesiger and Heidi Ream, who've done a lot of work within the guidelines. Uh, the Broad ClinGen team, especially Becky, who had assessed all the variants that Elenia and Grace had provided to see which ones would make the best examples for the workshop. Um, and then also the group who makes the variant curation interface I'm going to show um, in a moment here. So I'm going to transfer over to... All right. So this is the ClinGen variant curation interface, and this is what you'll be using for the, um, the workshop. Uh, that we'll be doing in the, the next section. And so if you want within the, I think there's a folder for variant workshop um, where I put some examples. So the first variant I'm gonna show during this demo, if you wanna go into that, oh, I think I should probably have it right here. This variant curation workshop is, I'm gonna go through this one that's labeled demo variant on the demo tab, if you want to follow along. If not, also no pressure. Um, just if it's helpful. So this is the ClinGen variant curation interface. Um, we will help you guys log in during the actual workshop, so don't worry about that part at this point. So I'm going to log in here. So in order to start a variant interpretation, you want to go up to click New Variant Interpretation to actually start this process. So in order to sort of control and make sure that the interface is looking at the variant of interest, they asked for a variant identifier, and this could be the ID from ClinVar um, or ClinGen's allele registry. So for all the cases that you're gonna do in the workshop within the spreadsheet, we've given you the IDs to put into here, so you don't have to worry about going to find those. Um, you know, you, will, you can follow through using the, um, the IDs that we'll provide. So in this case, I'm gonna start with a ClinVar ID. I'm um, assessing a missense variant in PAH, and the ID in ClinVar was one of click retrieve from ClinVar, 
And it'll bring back the different expressions from ClinVar, and this is a helpful point to make sure you didn't mistype the variant identifier um, to make sure that the variant it's returning, this 464G to A, PAH, yep, this is the variant I want to be assessing. So I'm gonna click Save and View Evidence. Okay, so now we're on this variant interpretation record. So you can see up at the top, it's again listing our variant. There's links out to ClinVar, dbSNP, UCSC, all up here in this top part. Then you can see all the ACMG criteria codes are listed, oops, are listed here. So they're all starting as white as you go through the process of adding criteria. Um, these will change color so you can kind of get a sense of where you are in the process. So if we scroll further down, we have all these different tabs, basic information, population, variant type, uh, case segregation, gene-centric, and so you can kind of work left to right going through these different tabs um, of assessing the evidence and seeing uh, if any criteria are applicable. Um, so I'm gonna start by looking at the basic information tab. This is, so the basic information and gene-centric are the only tabs that have no ACMJ criteria on them. They're just more background information about the variant to help you in the process. So looking at basic information, it summarizes interpretations from the VCI, which won't matter for these ones. It tells you information about this variant in ClinVar, if it's in ClinVar, so in this case, I can see it was submitted as pathogenic by Invitae. Um, if I keep scrolling down, I can look at information about the transcripts um, to see if maybe there is a more significant impact on a different transcript than the one I've selected, um, both for Ensemble and RefSeq. So in this case, that's the right transcript I want, so everything's good. So I'm gonna start with population data. So you can see here we have the different criteria that is applicable for population data, BA1, BS1, and PM2. And the default for all these right now is not evaluated. If you scroll down further, it brings in information from NOMAD, EXACT, and then if it was in 1000 Genomes ESP, you would be seeing those here as well. So in this case, I'm gonna use NOMAD because it's the largest cohort of all of these and look at what I'm seeing here. So you can see it is listing the genomic coordinates um, and you could link out here to um, NOMAD to confirm any of this, um, but they also are bringing in the data so you can look at it here. And it's summarizing again all of our little uh, subpopulations, what the allele count, allele number is, uh, you know, filtering from NOMAD. So in this case, because I'm looking at, oh, and then up here, um, they pull out whatever subpopulation has the highest minor allele frequency, um, just to sort of summarize it if it's helpful. Um, but in this case, they pulled out from exact. I'm gonna use no mat. Um, so in this case, we're looking at a recessive disorder. There's only six people in nomad total, so a 0.002%, um, you know, looks like it's the most common in East Asians with a 0.01. Since it's a recessive disorder, there's only two people. I feel like that is low enough to say that these absent or extremely low frequency for variants would be met. So I'm gonna change this PM2 from not evaluated to now say that it is met because it's low enough that I think absent. And you can add a note in here. So I'm gonna say, you know, only found in two of or some kind of note to give explanation as to why you were applying or not applying this criteria. So I'm gonna click Save. And now you can see if I scroll back up to the top, this PM2 has changed colors, showing that I had applied it. And this now little calculator section is showing that I now have applied one pathogenic moderate piece of evidence. So at this point, my calculation, my pathogenicity is uncertain significance. Um, because it's sort of a live process. So you still wanna continue through the whole thing, not just rely on what it says, of course, after one piece of data, but um, it's helpful to kind of know as you're going along. And right, and you can tell for all these population ones, there's an or between each one, because you only can apply one, because you can't say it's too high for, the allele frequency is too high for the disorder and it's absent. It wouldn't make sense to say met for both these, so it's sort of a way of controlling, you know, an incorrect click or something like that. So next I'm gonna move over to the variant type tab. So under variant type, you can, sell, you can tell there are a few sub-tabs, a missense tab, loss of function, silent intron, or inferent indel. And you can follow through on the sub-tab based on your variant type. In this case, I am looking at a missense variant, so I'd be looking at the missense tab. 
you know, if we were doing lots of function, you could click over lots of function and it asks you to evaluate whether PBS1 would be applicable or not. So since we're looking at in a sense, here's all the criteria that it's sort of applicable for some of the more computational impacts like the PP2 for if it's in a sense constrained or not, and the functional data, the PP3 versus PP4, if, if the in silico tools are saying, or suggesting damaging or not. And then further below here is now is all of our um, evidence here for the, or sorry, all of the different predictors. Uh, so in this case, it starts with a meta predictor, this Ravel predictor. Um, it's giving you kind of a score range, so it goes between zero and a one. Anything above a 0.75 is suggested to be impact. This one's at a 0.9, so suggesting an impact. And if I look at all these other scores, um, again, if you don't know what all these one letters mean, because nobody actually does, you can click this little button here next to predictors and it brings up the legend. Um, so D usually means damaging, so all of these are showing damaging. So overall, it looks like the in silico tools are saying are suggesting a damaging impact. Um, you could also go look at UCSC to look at conservation by clicking up here to either look at 38 or 37 genome build. Um, in this case, because this was the variant I showed during the other part, um, it was conserved and all the tools are saying damaging. So I'm gonna click net for PP3 and add in Something like all tools suggest damaging impact. Or if you even just have one tool you want to look at, you could write what that score was in this box or anything like that. So I'm gonna click save. And now again, you can see now my PP3 has changed colors because I've looked at that code. So another important thing to look at for the missense variants are whether or not there's any other pathogenic changes in this codon, and it could be a different missense change um, due to a, you know, within the same codon or maybe even the same amino acid change from a different nucleotide change. And a helpful tool to look at these is by looking in ClinVar to see if there's other variants in this codon. And so what's helpful is down here in the interface, they do call out how many other ClinVar variants are found within the same codon. So here they're saying there are two more variants in this codon besides the variant I'm looking at. So you can click ClinVar to go and it'll return all of these variants. So it's saying there are two there, and it's returning three because if your variant's in ClinVar, it's also always gonna return the variant you're looking at. So the variant I'm looking at is this histidine one, so this is the one I'm already looking at. So the two other ones, one has been called uncertain significance, the other has been called likely pathogenic. If I click into that one, kind of scroll down and look at the different interpretations, there's some likely path and uncertain. So in this case, I usually err more on the conservative side. So at this point, because it's not a very clearly pathogenic variant that's in that code, that other variant in the codon, I'm gonna say not met at this point. It is something you could come back and revisit and you know, maybe you could even decrease the weight if it was just likely pathogenic, but at this point I'm just gonna err on the conservative side and say, you know, no other. No other pathogenic variant. And now I've selected this one as not met as opposed to met because I actually went and looked at the evidence and so I want to actually say not met. And if you apply something as not met, you can see that it changes color but it grays it out to show that you looked at it and you ruled out this, uh, this criteria. So move on to experimental. This is where you could apply if PP, sorry, PM1, the hotspot or functional domain criteria is applicable or if there's any um, functional studies you'd want to apply. Um, so in this case, I don't have any of that kind of evidence, so I'm gonna skip over to case segregation. And in the uh, worksheet that I had, I added two different PubMed IDs that had evidence about this variant um, that I'm now gonna add into this variant. So um, you can kind of figure out what's the right place to add them. So in both cases, I have data that says, in two different papers, patients that had this variant and a pathogenic variant in trans had PKU. So in that case, I'd want to apply this under that in trans criteria, the PM3. So case segregation is for all the different case level data, the observed in a healthy adult PS2, uh, you know, the prevalence is statistically increased in cases over controls. So you can kind of scroll down to get to the evidence type that's applicable. So de novo, we didn't have any of those but the cis-trans one, so the recessive disorders. This is where I'd want to add in information that this variant has been seen in people who have the disease with that other variant in trans. 
So I'm going to actually add in PubMed ID that shows that you know, this information is coming from an outside source. So I'm going to click Add PubMed ID. I'm going to add in the number that I had written here. And for the workshop, we're providing all you with the PubMed IDs and the summary, so you don't have to worry about um, getting that information. So once I click Retrieve, it's going to return just you know, who the authors are and the title of the paper to make sure, again, you didn't just accidentally mistype the number or something. So this is a paper about PAH gene. Yes, OK, this is the one I wanted. So you can see now it's added in your paper here. And then there's this box for saying, which criteria type is this paper with regards to? Um, so it is with regards to PM3. You know, this work gets a little confusing. I'm saying it's about PM3, but it's not, I'm not saying PM3 is met yet. That would be up here once I add all my evidence. And that's because, you know, let's say for like segregation data, you had five papers that each had one segregation that individually, none of them actually met PP1. You're saying it's part of the segregation data. It's not that you add them all in that you then want to decide if that criteria is met or not met and if you want to change the weight. So I'm saying that this is part of the PM3 evidence type. Um, and then I'm going to add in my evidence that um, variant found in trans with pathogenic R111X variant in patient with PKU, or some kind of summary that explains what you got out of this paper. I'm going to click Save. And so now you can see this publication has been added under this allelic data section, showing what the paper was, what criteria it's with regards to, and then what was my evidence from that. In this case, I also have a second PubMed ID with another occurrence. Kind of click retrieve. Oh, I copied over the wrong one. This is about Costello. We're going to pretend that this I wrote down the right PubMed ID and that this is the paper I should be doing. <laughs> this is only in a demo interface. So this isn't going to go anywhere. But we'll pretend this is the right paper. And I'm going to add in a note that this, again, I found in a separate patient. The variant I'm looking at was found in trans with pathogenic R2. All right, so now I've had added in both these PubMed IDs. Each had one proband who had this variant in trans with another pathogenic variant. So if you remember when I was going through sort of this criteria saying we had this quantitative framework for how to determine the strength of PM3 based off multiple occurrences. And if you look actually within the variant curation workshop, we've included the um, PDFs of these so that you can have it within the guidelines. Um, so looking at our criteria here, so I had two cases that had a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in trans. So I give each one of those cases one point, and then so that'd be two points total, which means I could move PM3 up to a strong strength level, because two points is our threshold for that. So going back to the interface. So for PM3, if I click on it, instead of saying just met, which would be at that strength level that it already is, I'm going to say that actually I want to apply PM3 at this strong strength level, and then add an explanation variant found in trans with pathogenic variants in two probands. So sort of summarizing what both papers kind of said. Um, this is also where if you had laboratory data that what didn't have a PubMed ID, you could add it into your overall explanation um, for this criteria because there's not, at this point, a way to add in the granular unpublished data, but we are working on that. I'm going to click Update. So now this strong piece of evidence has been applied. So if I scroll back up here, you can see PM3 is now colored because I applied it. The color doesn't change based off whether or not you've modified the weight. So even though it's you know, coloring it here at the moderate strength level, I actually did apply it at a strong strength level. And you can see now sort of our summary, we have one strong, one moderate, one supporting um, at this point. So what I'm going to do next is now click over to our view summary. And this is a helpful thing as you're going along to be able to see what criteria you've selected. So it shows we've applied PM3 at a strong strength level. We've applied PM2 at this moderate, which is the absence. And multiple tools are saying a damaging impact. So at this point, you know, I, once you've gone through all the evidence, you can decide if this is 
applicable if you, you know, you could modify the strength if you felt like, okay, in the end, even though it's likely pathogenic, I actually think it's pathogenic, you could modify the strength, you have to write a note, um, but you can also provide like a full evidence summary that could take all of the pieces of evidence you've seen and put it into one now more conclusive paragraph explaining all the evidence that you've seen um, and be able to save that. So there is also a component you could add in disease and inheritance. I've included those for all the variants you're gonna look at. It's um, not a requirement. The um, system makes you do that before you would ever approve and share the variant outside um, that you don't need to worry about it at this point, but if you want to, there is this component to add a disease. Um, we use the Mondo ontology um, and we've provided all of the IDs for those that you can add in um, in order to save to so you can actually give it a disease and mode of inheritance um, when you're saving these. So that's a very brief overview of the VC. I, I will go show you sort of how to log in and everything during the workshop um, and we'll go through um, different examples from the uh, cases that you did the filtration on yesterday um, as well as a few additional variants um, that have just some fun little types of evidence that uh, you can look at. So is there any, any questions about curation interface, variant curation in general, before we break for a workshop, or break for a break, then a workshop? All right, doesn't look like anything. All right, well then, I guess, oh, I ended up actually ending early now. Um, so let's have, I guess, a little bit of a longer break. Oh, yeah. Can you only curate a variant in Sharp if it's been in ClinVar? No, so that's why, so there is that option also for the uh, ClinGen allele registry ID. So for a couple of the variants you're gonna do during the um, workshop, I provided those instead because they are not in ClinVar. So what I can, I can show you really quick what the, so the ClinGen allele allows, it gives an identifier for any variant. So everything from ClinVar has already been put into the allele registry as well as I think everything in Exact and Nomad have all been registered. Um, so what it does is allows you to sort of search a variant. So you could put in by HGVS with genomic co coordinates, RefSeq, anything. And if it already exists in the allele registry, it'll tell you it's in there. Um, if it doesn't, it'll tell you like, yes, what you've put in is valid, meaning like, you have your expression right, this would be a real variant. It's not in here, do you want to register it? And then you just have to like click a button and then it returns you with an ID to have. Okay. Um, so in order to use the little registry, just to like see if something's in there, you don't have to have a login, but I think you have to have a profile in order to register alleles, right? Yes, yeah. So in this case, I've already registered all these alleles, so you have the IDs. Um, but yes, that's, so that is a good question. It is, the interface is not limited to things that are in ClinVar. It's a helpful, you know, sort of way to, get variants, but um, you could also use the little registry, which you could use for um, almost any type of variant and be able to get an ID that way and then put that into the interface. And one thing I should note, so we're gonna give you guys today during the workshop URLs to sort of dummy instances of the variant curation interface, but if anybody's interested in it, you can also, we can send this out afterwards. Um, it's just curation-test at clinicalgenome.org and up at the top, I'm gonna log out. There's this demo login button that anyone can go in, click in and do a, an assessment that doesn't ask for any kind of login information. So you're welcome to go play and see, you know, play around in the, in the interface. One caveat is for this demo test version, it gets wiped about once a month. So I wouldn't do anything in there that you then want to take seriously and want to use later on. But if you just are looking to sort of play around and see if this is um, helpful, um, you're welcome to go through that approach. And then um, on the main page, the just, um, curation.clinicalgenome. Oh, there is a, um, an email if you want to have it, an official login where you want to try um, being able to use the variant curation interface. And it's publicly available free, so there's not, um, you know, you don't have to be associated with any kind of group or anything in order to use uh, this interface. Any other questions? Yeah. So when you're, when you're trying to lower the BA1 from 5%, to, so you typically do that in a disease manner. So for example, you know, when the cardiomyopathy group was applying one, they looked for, they were using hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because it was the most common of all the cardiomyopathies. But that threshold they got, they could then apply to every gene that's associated with any of the inherited cardiomyopathies because they took a very conservative approach 
which would then be applicable to all the card maps. So it's not, you don't have to recalculate it for every variant, but kind of depending on what your initial framework is will depend on how applicable it is across, you know, a whole disease area or not. And if they've been done, they're in FinVar, you wouldn't do that as a, like your own, the lab person doing one report. You would look in to see what FinVar has in there, or so these would approved to do it for a category. Is that generally how that's used? So with the different expert panels within FinGen have uh, published their guidelines that says what, you know, their thresholds for BA1 and BS1 are so that you, you could use those if you are you know, in a laboratory and you come across a variant in PAH and you want to know what they say the threshold for benign PA, you could go look at their paper and be able to determine that. Um, but laboratories can use this as well. I mean, I know multiple laboratories that have used a similar approach um, and they've kept things very broad to have it applicable across like a whole panel or disease area so that they can you know, confidently put lots of variants as benign in a you know, conservative manner that they don't have to look at every time. Um, often based again on just sort of taking a conservative common estimate of, of prevalence and starting from there. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Could you walk through um, when you showed us the same co alterations within the same codon mm -hmm. and then the second then you went towards um, the hot spot, can you talk about the distinction there and like whether you'd apply one versus the other? Yeah, so that does get a little bit confusing. So the, um, see, actually I'll just pull up the, Yeah, so you're talking about the difference between saying there is a, another missense change that's pathogenic at this codon versus a hot spot. That's, so it varies a little. So you know, a hot spot is often de predefined as like, okay, at this codon, we have seen every single change that's possible at this codon. All of them have always been pathogenic. You know, like, so I th like glycine 12, I think, in a lot of the RAS genes. It's been seen is always a hotspot. So like, okay, that is a well-defined hotspot. Whereas the PM5 um, is more, you know, oh, I've seen one other pathogenic change within this codon. I think it's a place. So there is some overlap. I believe some groups actually have applied both for the same variant. Like if it's a hotspot in which seems a little like double counting, that is something we will be reconsidering the, so one thing I didn't also mention, ACMG just formed the next group to take a look at this and now make a second version of the guidelines. And I feel confident there's gonna be some condensing of certain criteria types because um, there is some inherent overlap in different types of evidence. And I think that would be one where it's, um, and I think Heidi, you've even mentioned before that like even the functional domain, the way some groups have used it is not how it was attended when it was writing, but it was meant for like much more discrete couple of residue units and not like, oh, these five exons together is one big functional domain, that it should be a little more narrow in scope. Um, so yeah, I think it'll hopefully have a little better guidance on that in the future of how to sort of decide which one is more applicable than the other. Especially since you're co that Yes. So we'll see if people agree with me. So I'm going to go to the SBI website really quick, <laughs> click on our recommendation for reputable source, <laughs> which, oh, I can't remember what actually but we wrote a letter to the editor in genetics and medicine last year actually suggesting that people not use reputable source at all um, because it does lead to inherent double counting. Because if you are using evidence, you're like, oh, there was this functional assay, I'm going to use it in my, in my assessment, and oh, this other group that also looked at the functional assay is called the variant pathogenic, I'm now going to use that as well that it just is inherent overlap in that type that we have recommended people not use the reputable source criteria at all. And can I just add to that, the reason we added this rule in the original guideline is because at the time, Myriad had an enormous amount of data that was not accessible or being used by anyone in the world, and we were taking all the patient reports and entering their variants into ClinVar for community use. And so we felt that those classifications were based on a data set 
not being used by anyone. And, that, and so we put it in for that one use case. It has led to awful misuse. Um, and in fact, you know, we're no longer continuing that project. Anything from that project is out of date. And so we basically said there is no current source that meets this criteria, and it's just been drastically misused, so we've taken it out. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, would recommend not using it at all. Any other questions? All right, I think we can go on our break then.